Uh, it's, it's a big claim to, uh, to append the, uh, the subtitle uh, Pest Control in Ballarat because I don't think I'll be touching on that. Well, I, I will. Right at the end, I'll be touching on it, and you'll be amazed at the, uh, at the method of uh, pest control that I discovered uh, in, uh, in, in mid-20th century Ballarat. But we're going to go back a lot earlier than that to begin with. I want you to cast your imaginations back to a chilly Saturday in August 1868 to the Ballarat Railway Station, or the station then known as Ballarat West, or just the Western Station, and specifically to the depot where freight was unloaded. The good sheds would have been steeped in shadow that winter afternoon. Even so, a dark shape, let's note that one, darted through, <laughs> darting through the gloom, caught the eye of one of the railmen, handing off freight from a train just in from Melbourne. Rat, he sung out and pointed his finger like a gun barrel. The chase was on. Men and boys flung themselves at piled up crates and sacks poking and squinting and chivying until their quarry made a break into the open, whereupon a lad with a dust shovel stunned it with a lucky blow. Not lucky for the rat, of course. Now, it was a black rat, a black rat apparently, like this one. Not especially big rat, about that long, that with the tail. The fact it was black branded it as what they called a, ship, a ship's rat, no doubt direct from the Melbourne docks. Needless to say, it was quickly dispatched by the railman, but its fleeting appearance made news. The Ballarat Star noted the goods train from Melbourne had brought us an unwelcome visitor. Because the thing is, there were supposed to be no rats at Ballarat. Whoops, hang on. I'm supposed to be not even a Siberian hamster. Ever, ever since its founding, the place had been renowned for its ratlessness. Elsewhere on the gold fields and in pastoral districts, let alone in the big cities and towns, rats inevitably followed in the footsteps of humans and their livestock. But Ballarat shared with Beechworth the proud distinction of having no rats. Just a fortnight before that unlucky rat debarked from the Melbourne train, the Ballarat star had poo-pooed the claims of Cheyenne, Wyoming, a city of 7,000 inhabitants at that time, that claimed it was probably the only city in the world free from rats. That claim had been disputed in the first instance by Salt Lake City, Utah, which was twice as populous as Cheyenne and was likewise rat-free. Now, the star boasted that Ballarat has the advantage of both those places, for though it contains four times the number of inhabitants as of Cheyenne, it has neither rats nor Mormons. <laughs> it was a curious thing, people agreed, that a city whose very name, Ballarat, suggests the presence of the rodent animal, and we all know it as the rat. By contrast, the rival city of Sandhurst, or Bendigo, was said to be the rat mecca of Australia. A traveller who marvelled at, at a Bendigo cat ignoring a rat that sauntered past in broad daylight was told, the fact is, the rats here are too big for the cats to tackle. There was thought to be something in the climate, as you said, or situation of Ballarat, which is obnoxious to rats who like its surroundings no more than the proverbial sinking ship. In a letter to the Ballarat Star in 1858, a correspondent calling herself the rat catcher's daughter wondered if there might, it might be the arsenic in Ballarat's groundwater that rats found disagreeable. Nearly 20 years, I don't know what effect it had on the humans. Nearly 20 years later came a report that some troublemaker had attempted to actually introduce rats to Ballarat, but of the dozen purportedly smuggled up from Melbourne, half expired, uh, was said to have expired in captivity, while the rest died within days of being released into Ballarat's unfavourable atmosphere. I'd like to know how the reporter could possibly have known <laughs> that they died somewhere out on the streets of Ballarat. Uh, unless, of course, the rats were fitted with trackers, some sort of primitive uh, steam-powered, possibly, or clockwork uh, device. Far from encouraging the introduction of rats, civic pride saw to it that any sighting triggered a swarm of hunters and a well-publicised kill. As the Star put it in 1868, the freedom which Ballarat has enjoyed from the plague of rats is a boon, the maintenance of which is worth fighting hard for. To that end, 
the two local councils, Ballarat West and Ballarat East, jointly offered a reward of two pounds to anyone who killed a rat in Ballarat and produced evidence of same. I can't believe how many times I use the word kill, killed or killing in, uh, in the process of this, but, you know, there's a war on. That reward would go unclaimed for several years, and then in the space of just one week in October 1871, two claims were lodged. One came from a Mr Lucock, poulterer of Victoria Street, and we all know how fowls attract rats. The rat caught at Lucock's premises was a good-sized male of a pretty brown colour, so it would have been a... Norwegian rat, like this one, with a white tip to his tail. I like that one. But um, Mr. Lucock had failed to produce evidence of the kill, and so the reward was granted to Mrs. Ramsey and Robinson, who had preserved the skin of a rat caught at their flour mill and sent the skin to the council with their claim. It was submitted to the Finance Committee. I'd love to have been at that meeting. <laughs> There was actually a third contender at that time. Uh, a, cat had, a, cat, a rat had been captured in a culvert at Ballarat East, but it turned out to be a water rat, a native, rather than a verminous land rat, as they called them, and so was disqualified. This flurry of claims gives the impression that rats must have been getting a bit of a toehold of Ballarat in the early 1870s. Yet, late in that decade, it was still firmly declared that there is not a rat in Ballarat and you continue to see occasional reports of an individual unin unintentionally imported rat being hunted down. Usually it was in the vicinity of the railway goods sheds at Ballarat East or West. Around 1873, the craze for rat sightings was temporarily eclipsed by reports of bunyip sightings in Ballarat. <laughs> One letter to the Ballarat Star gave a facetious account of an encounter with the Wendery bunyip which the writer explained away as the splashy commotion of a male musk duck accompanied by the bellowing cry of a bittern. Go up to the swamp any moderately clear night, he wrote, you will hear the bunyip and with a little patience and imagination you will also see him. And he concluded we have no rats, no ghosts, the spirits are a failure here, but we do have the bunyip. Back to rats though. Early in 1881 we come across this report. A pure white female rat was killed yesterday morning by a cat in one of Mr Parkinson's houses in Dawson Street and measuring 15 and a half inches from snout to the tip of tail. Hitherto we have been free from the presence of these noxious animals but it appears that a resident of Humphrey Street has of late had several white pet rats, pet rats about his place and that the one killed yesterday is the progeny. Then, just three months later, there was this. A recent attempt on the part of two rats to acclimatise themselves in Ballarat has very properly come to grief. On Saturday last, these two victims, vermins, rather, vermin, were discovered taking up their quarters in the premises of Mr Steinfeld and Levinson, furniture makers, of Bridge Street. But an impromptu rat hunt was got up by the youths of the neighbourhood and in a very short space of time, the intruders were dispatched. The youngsters are to be rewarded by the town council for their very patriotic exertions. The thing is, of course, if you've got two rats, you've probably got more. <laughs> a female rat produces three to four broods a year of between eight and 14 offspring each time. And so it's no surprise that a year later, this is in April 1882, we read that the capture of rats in Ballarat is becoming a rather common occurrence. The glory days were over. At the beginning of 1883, there was this report in the Courier. Rats have fully established themselves in Ballarat, having found a home in the shops of Bridge Street. The hat establishment of Mr Morris and the grocery adjoining being the scene so far of their principal depredations. In Mr Morris's shop, they have become so numerous that he's been obliged to keep traps constantly set for them. Here's Bridge Street in 1882, and you can see there, um, just to the uh, left, right, sorry, of the, of the lamppost, C. Morris Hatter. So that was the, uh, that was, uh, well, it seems to have been ground zero for the Ballarat incursion. Um, in 1880, five years after that last report, the Bendigo advertiser reprinted with apparent satisfaction the Courier's latest update on the Ballarat rat situation. The notion once entertained that, that rats could not exist in Ballarat has long since been dispelled. 
and latterly they have been increasing so fast about Bridge Street that many tradesmen suffer great loss by the damage done to goods. The vermin have also found their way up Victoria and Will Street. The champion specimen was captured on Tuesday in Mr JJ Fitzgerald's shop in Bridge Street, its measurement when put to the tape being 22 inches from snout to tip of tail. That's a big rat. Later that same year, 1888, a report widely circulated, circulated to the effect that the rats in Ballarat East have spread with alarming rapidity in the last 12 months. One tradesman trapped over 100 in a month and another has suffered damages to his stock amounting to 50 pounds. In fact, the stock storekeepers in Bridge Street are comparing the ravages to those of the rabbits in other parts of the colonies. Now, besides the efficacy of traps, the report remarked that rough-on rats seems a favourite article of food to those vermin in Ballarat. Here was an advertisement uh, from the newspaper. Rough-on rats clears out rats, mice, roaches, flies, ants, bed bugs, beetles, insects, skunks, jackrabbits, sparrows, gophers at chemists and druggists. Um, it originated in America, as you might guess from that advertisement, and obviously the local distributors didn't see any need to uh, adapt the, uh, the, the copy to the Australian market. And another advertisement I've seen mentioned chipmunks. Um, <laughs> like other raticides, um, uh, Rough on Rats, sorry, uh, Rough on Rats was the best known brand of rat poison in Australia. There were others with names like uh, Scatter Rats, and I like this one, Rat Dynamite. Rough on Rats, um, like other rat raticides, was, an arsenic, was arsenic based and it had coal dust added for colouring. It was one of those products that became a household name, but its fame or notoriety partly had to do with the popularity of rough on rats for doing away with oneself. Yes, it reg regularly featured in newspaper reports of suicide, which puts the slogan, don't die in the house, which featured prominently at the beginning of most of their ads in a rather a different light. By the, middle of, um, by the middle of 1888, the Ballarat press were evidently so inured to the idea of rats in their midst, they could afford to make sport of it. So we read this. A kind of coursing match took place in Bridge Street yesterday morning about seven o'clock. The leaders in the chase being a German Lutheran minister and Mr Spielvogel, financier. The object of the hunt was a rat of large size, which was, was observed by the reverend gentleman and his friend while frisking about the street in the grey light of morning. I think the rat was frisking rather than the two gentlemen. <laughs> Among the spectators of the coursing were two policemen, a corporation labourer and three butcher boys. The running powers of the coursers, who were armed with umbrellas, were tested to the utmost extent that the sport did not result in a kill as the rodent found cover from its pursuers in a culvert. An onlooker remarked that the rats in Ballarat are getting bold when they afford sport to pedestrians in the street. And this brings us to another chapter in the colonial history of rats, not specifically Ballarat, but we'll get back here. You see, making sport of, or rather with, rats was nothing new. Decades before that rat set Mr Spielvogel capering along Bridge Street on a, in the grey light of morning, back in 1860 to be exact, we're still in Ballarat. The Ballarat Star reported, we understand the landlord of one of the hotels on the main road contemplates establishing a rat pit in connection with his premises. A rat pit. What on earth was a rat pit? It was a venue for a supposed sport whereby terriers bred for hunting were tested by throwing them in the ring with a bunch of rats and seeing how many they could kill within a set time. It was called killing against time. Uh, fascinating, whenever you see an illustration of the rat pit, the, the rats are trying to make their way up the corners. You see the corners especially chamfered to, uh, against their escape. Um, of course, it was mainly a pretext, as most sports are, for gambling. In a solo bout where just one dog was being tested, a challenge would be set of killing, say, 50 rats in 10 minutes, and you'd bet either on the dog or on the clock. When two dogs competed against one another, you'd bet on the one you thought would kill the most rats in the time allotted. Of course, they wouldn't put two dogs in the pit at once or it'd be impossible to keep track of which dog killed which rats. So each dog would have its allotted time in the ring and the one killing the most rats was the winner. Now, 
Unsurprisingly, the proposal to establish a rat pit in Ballarat in 1860 was immediately and vigorously opposed. In the absence of rodents locally, the aspiring rat pit impresario intended bringing a supply from Melbourne and breeding them up. Well, there was a public outcry and a municipal bylaw was swiftly introduced whereby whosoever willingly and knowingly shall convey into or through the borough or within the borough have in his possession or on his premises or receive any rats shall on conviction forfeit to every rat a sum not exceeding 40 shillings and any person may seize and forthwith destroy any rat within the borough whether confined or not. Presumably this was the origin of the reward, two pounds. At any rate, that put the mockers on any plans for a rat pit at Ballarat, at least so far as the surviving records uh, will show. But elsewhere, here's just another. These are English rat pits, uh, the ones we've been seeing so far. See these little uh, the little rat stops at the corner, uh, and this one had twin twin galleries, packed. Interesting. There were two men in the in, in the ring here. One one was usual. Elsewhere in 1860, rat pits were all the go. In May the previous year, 1859, a seemingly innocuous letter to the editor had appeared in Bell's Life in Victoria and Sporting Chronicle, a Melbourne newspaper that specialised in all things sport. Headed the rat nuisance, the letter went like this. Sir, as the large amount of property destroyed annually in Melbourne by rats is estimated to be considerable, some steps should be taken to exterminate the vermin. We are not yet blessed with professional rat catchers and it is doubtful whether such a thing as a ferret exists in the colony. I'm told their introduction has been a failure, the long sea voyaging having as yet proved fatal to them. Traps never answer for long. The only resource, therefore, is either poison or dogs trained for ratting. I'm not a sporting man, <laughs> I'd bet, but there are many gentlemen in Melbourne who, in the old country, have doubtless taken a great interest in ratting, and who are proficient in the training of dogs for the purpose. To such, I would suggest the establishment of a rat pit in some central part of the city. And lo, it came to pass. In less than a week, Bell's Life reported that just such a rat pit was under construction, and in less than a few weeks, it was up and running. It was located at the back of the Butcher's Arms Hotel in Elizabeth Street, not far from the Burke Street corner. It may seem strange to us, but it was, it was pretty usual to have a rat pit, um, establish a rat pit as an adjunct to a hotel like you would a skittle alley or a music hall. The Butcher's Arms was already an established sporting venue um, hosting regular boxing bouts. Well, the rat pit was inaugurated with a soft opening at the end of June 1859, on which occasion several gentlemen tried their terriers who soon disposed of any quantity of rats. Two newly imported ferrets, which had so far survived the voyage, were tried and afforded amusement to those who had never seen a ferret attack rats. Sounds a great night out, doesn't it? <laughs> Rat fighting. Here's another one. Um, look at these. Gen now, I'm sure that this, uh, these gentlemen are meant to be particular gentlemen. They have that look, don't they? They look like they'd be members of parliament or, or you know, the peerage. Uh, again, this is a, a, an English um, illustration. Rat fighting, as it was called in the sporting press, may sound like a low-rent kind of sport, but it seemed to appeal to men, almost exclusively men, up and down the class spectrum. Dog fanciers were keen to test their terriers and gentlemen of a sporting turn of mind were keen to bet on them. And many seem just to have been entertained by the spectacle of a ferret killing a rat or whatever. One way or another, there was big money in rat pits. Now, these terriers being tested were mainly fox terriers or the newly bred, at that time, Jack Russell terriers. The original Jack Russells were bred by their namesake, an English parson and fox hunting enthusiast who crossed the traditional black and tan terrier with a white one. Um, having, well, sort of anyway. Having a dog with a predominantly white coat was important so that hunters could easily differentiate the dog from the fox in the wild. The Reverend Jack Russell's breeding program began with a female terrier named Trump. He bought her from a local milkman. Nowadays in breeding circles, I believe uh, she's referred to as the lesser known Trump. Um, <laughs> Russell prided himself on his terrier's tempered aggressiveness. 
It was said they never tasted blood, and that was a key to speed in the rat pit. In one of the first matches in the Melbourne rat pit, a dog named Beauty was pitted against another called Fan to to kill 12 rats each. While Beauty dashed helter-skelter about the pit, in her turn, in her turn, Fan, the favourite and winner, with an appearance of method, deliberately picked out her rat from the corner, retired to the middle of the pit, there with one grip and shake, killed it, and without apparent haste, returned for another. Now, to begin with, the Butcher's Arms rat pit was open just twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays, but pretty soon it was operating six nights a week. The ferrets seemed to be thriving at last, and for variety, a native cat, which I think was probably a quoll, was put in the ring with a rat for an exhibition bout. That experiment turned out a failure. The quoll wasn't much interested in catching and killing a rat, not for sport anyway. On future occasions, though, quolls would be introduced to the ring instead of rats as prey for a terrier. Pretty soon, dogs were being matched to kill not 12, but 50 and even 100 rats at a time. So here we have a great night sport. Uh, the well-known sporting blah, 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 killing 50 rats in four minutes. Another crack dog to kill 12 rats in a minute. Um, the imported ferrets nip, nip and jack <laughs> to kill six large rats each. Um, and the native cats, exciting matches with native cats, etc. And here we've got 100 native cats are expected. Uh, so there was a lot of killing to be seen. And, and, uh, and the reports of these matches used to appear in, uh, in Bell's Life under the, under the head, heading um, uh, rat fighting, which was a bit of a euphemism. I don't know that rats did much fighting. Um, a bull terrier named Tipu, I don't know if Tipu's mentioned there, Tipu uh, was the first on this side of the world to perform the feat of killing 100 rats uh, in a match. He killed them in 12 minutes, which is interesting because I know that this one was going to kill 50 rats in four minutes, but they had to stop, they, they had let the dog have a rest uh, from time to time. And they, it was just like a boxing match. They'd wash its mouth and things like that. So, that, you know, it, it, it had to do it in, uh, in stages. The, um, so greatly is this sport rising in public estimation, Bell's life would report. The rat pit was crammed, or they'd say filled to overflowing, and was not nearly large enough to hold the concourse desirous of witnessing this match. The yard and passages were crowded with numbers anxious to learn the result. Of course, the, the result was their bets, if you can imagine it. Um, so popular was the rat pit that its proprietor, Henry, Henry Chandler, soon expanded his operations to the Hippodrome, opposite the Melbourne Hospital in Lonsdale Street. It was one of the largest halls in Melbourne and Chandler had a rat pit constructed therein of plate glass, which will allow a large audience to see without the crowding of which has hitherto been complained. Um, and they also would have an exhibition of the mongoose and venomous snakes. So they do that in conjunction with a fellow in Melbourne who, who had just patented a, uh, a snake bite cure. And he, he would... Um, uh, like not so much with the mongoose, but with, uh, with the dogs. He would treat the dog, he'd put the dog and the snake in the pit and then he'd treat the dog with the snake bite cure and, and miracles would be performed apparently. But yes, someone had just arrived from India with a mongoose and so they said, let's chuck it in the rat pit. You know, it was, it was any, anything went. Um, this is not quite a glass pit. This one's actually mirrored, and this is a, a, an illustration of the Paris dog show at around this same period. So um, the, the dog would be confused, presumably, by seeing its reflection and the reflection of rats, which must, must have been under the flower pots. So it was obviously retrieving all the rats from the flower pots and not getting confused by their reflections. Um, the Butcher's Arms rat pit continued on under the management of a very eccentric sounding chap called George Strike, who acted the part of ringmaster and referee combined. After five years, he had the rat pit completely rebuilt on more stately lines with a plate glass pit and spacious galleries of raked cushion seating, two galleries, one above the other, like we saw in that illustration before, and everything conducive to the comfort and enjoyment of the patrons. According to Bell's Life, the opening of this temple where rats were to be nightly sacrificed was hailed with pleasure, not only by the owners of celebrated killers, but by those who suffer the most from the depredations of the muridae, that is, of rats. Every night in the rat pit, there'd be numerous bouts, 
even in the early days when the dogs were matched to kill just 10 or a dozen rats apiece, that meant maybe 100 rats or more each night. But once you had 50 or 100 rats killed in a single match, it got harder to keep the supply up. On one such occasion, a report in Bell's Life concluded, but for the scarcity of rats, the killing would have gone, been prolonged to a late hour. Between July and October 1859, that's just, what, four months, an estimated 15,000 rats were killed in the Melbourne rat pit and they would um, boast over the years of killing at least 20,000 rats a year. So, you know, they, um, this was billed as a, a service to the Melbourne public. To ensure a constant supply of rats, the rat pit at its peak offered, but get this, six shillings a dozen for live rats. That was a lot of money. At that price, you could get rich catching rats and no doubt in time there were enterprising souls who bred them up specially. Um, I, I cannot believe he caught many rats with those tongs but, um, <laughs> or, or how well the rats survived, but uh, I think it's a bit fanciful. Um, over time, there'd be several more rat pits in Melbourne, but during the 1870s, Oh, hang on, I missed something. As lads, the Smith brothers at Port Melbourne, sorry, used to catch 300 to 400 rats a week for the pit, mainly around the docks, abattoirs and boiling down, that is the fat rendering works, but also at some of the big city hotels, some of the luxurious city hotels. They were fine times, I can tell you, Harry Smith would later recall. There he is in his old age. He's still got his dog and some dead rats in front of him. Um, I also read of a lad who was employed as a cash boy in uh, Buckley and Nunn's Drapers in Burke Street. Part of his job was to keep the store free of rats, for which Buckley and Nunn's would pay him a bounty of fourpence a head. Instead of using the traps they supplied, he used wire cages to catch the rats alive. And then after claiming his fourpence, would take them down the road to the rat pit and collect several shillings more. Over time, there were several rat pits in Melbourne, but during the 1870s, they would be closed down under the Prevention to, of Cruelty to Animals Act. It was cruelty to dogs that was at issue here. The rats, <laughs> the rats being vermin didn't qualify as animals, and there had been instances where the rats would turn on the, uh, would turn on the dogs and nip them and so on, and, you know, that was the objection. Um, in 1900, the bubonic plague broke out in Melbourne, and there'd be calls to revive the rat pit at that time. The City Council ignored such calls, instead mandating dustbins with lids. Not near as romantic, and you couldn't really bet on it um, the same way. Back in 1860, when the original rat pit was in full swing, a letter writer took exception to a report in the Melbourne Argus comparing the disreputable proceedings at a City Council meeting to conduct more typical of a rat pit. I consider such an illusion to be quite uncalled for and out of place, wrote the aggrieved correspondent, inasmuch as the strictest decorum is invariably observed at the place of entertainment in question, that is the rat pit. Uh, he felt that the standard of behaviour there was far better than in a city council meeting and, uh, and, and felt umbrage on the part of his um, <laughs> of the rat pit. Um, crowds. Later in the 1870s it became a standard trope of political commentary to liken Parliament to a rat pit and parliamentarians to rats. One humorist in the Melbourne press at that time wrote the atmosphere of Ballarat seems to be unfavourable to rats. Eureka! I have an idea. Let us move the Legislative Assembly to Ballarat without further delay. <laughs> so here's a question. Was there ever a rat pit at Ballarat? There was a cranky letter to the Ballarat Star in 1879 objecting to attempts by the Mechanics Institute to attract younger members with racy novels and billiard tables. The next thing, said the writer, will be the introduction of skittles and then perhaps cox cockfighting or a rat pit. That never happened. But a Mr W Ramage, I think his name was Wally, would tell a meeting of the Ballarat Historical Society in 1935 that there was a time in the early history of Ballarat when fox terriers were placed in pits to engage in battle royal with rats. Now, that's interesting. Last year, in a neat conjunction of circumstances, I delivered the Ballarat Historical Society Spielvogel oration, same Spielvogel, at the Mechanics Institute in Sturt Street. When I took questions at the end, someone piped up to ask if I'd ever heard that there'd once been no rats in Ballarat. And afterwards, Kevin Williams from the Historical Society sent me some photos 
of a building that used to stand at the corner of Main Road and Humphrey Street, reputedly the site of a former rat pit and long known as the rat, he said. Um, this photo looks to date from the, uh, the attire of this woman to the 1930s, so I wonder whether Mr Ramage actually uh, had this photo as part of his original presentation to the um, Historical Society. Um, this one shows the rat, and it's written at the top there, the rat being demolished in, I think, 1955. Um, you can see the uh, Ballarat East Post Office in the background there. Um, and the circle building is, the, is identical with this one here. So it was right on the corner there of those, um, of those roads. Here's, how, oh, here's an aerial view from about 1925, so you can picture where that was. So, um, and and here's, here's how the rat would fit in that corner today. It'd be in the post office uh, there. And, uh, and here's the other view um, with um, St Paul's in the background. So um, admittedly, it's a curious thing that the rat pit proposed in 1860 was to be located at a hotel in the main road. Now, I'm not sure, my, my research has not told me whether there was a hotel at that corner, but one wouldn't be surprised with a hotel at most corners, and that pure white rat caught in 1881 was said to be the progeny of pet rats being kept by a resident of Humphrey Street, which makes you wonder. Well, that's nearly the end of the story as I know it. Nearly, but not quite. In 1953, a Mr S. Harris mounted a crusade against the rats of Ballarat, or at least the rats of the York Street tip. Mr Harris went there one day to dump some rubbish and found the tip crawling with rats. He picked up a brick and killed three of them and then he thought, why not shoot them? As you do. This is from an article from the Melbourne Argus. So began Ballarat's rat war. Mr Harris said, I thought I would help the community and have a bit of sport at the same time. You know, the same impulse that drove the rat pit in the first place. He applied for a council permit for himself and two colleagues and the three men have now shot and killed in about nine months more than 8,000 rats. The men use spring-loaded .22 air rifles mounted on spotlights run by motorcycle batteries. Mr Harris said, we always fire into the tip, so there's no danger of anyone being hit. <laughs> he said they averaged about 200 rats a night and went shooting generally on two nights a week. Their best effort was more than 300 rats in a single night. And uh, they didn't have to look for a place to dispose of them. I mean, that was always a big question for me. Where did these rats go, the hundreds that were killed each night uh, at the Melbourne rat pit, the mind boggles. Well, for all that Ballarat ended up, like everywhere else, overrun by rats, some faint uh, trace of its reputation as a rat desert must have lingered into the 20th century. As evidence, I leave you with a, a half-baked riddle from the funnies pages of a Mildura newspaper in 1932. This is it. Why are rats scarce in Ballarat? Because there's only one rat in Ballarat. <laughs> Not just one rat. There's the one, there's the one we're all terrified of now. <laughs>